Hi everyone. We're um, presenting on sustainable um, buildings and our topic is Green City. I'm Michelle and I'm Alex. So basically 2020 was a mess. Global warming was messing up the environment. Um, sea level is rising. Uh, na natural disasters are happening more frequently and in greater uh, magnitudes. Just look at the wildfire in Australia in the 2019-2020 season. So, so to tackle this problem, we decided to enforce the Green New Deal and especially be focused on a specific goal, which is building or upgrading to energy efficient, distributed, and smart power grids and ensuring affordable access to electricity. So the first step we decided to take was having the government take primary responsibility in um, global warming situation. Uh, this is because, like in Noah's archive, Cohen said that in the wake of catastrophe, suffering is unequally distributed. So failures over care are bad. So we thought that uh, the government taking initiative would, it, it would enable us to like implement more inclusive policies compared to like what private companies and individuals could do. And also it could be more efficient because just the changes coming from a central um, source of power. So what the government did is firstly rejoining her support which is an international agreement designed to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this would help uh, the situation in 2020 because it's not just America that is invested, it shows that it's not just America that's invested in um, the climate change issue. We can um, get help from others and also mm -hmm. help other countries save the earth. And also this would enable us to set a national goal to motivate our fellow Americans to strive to recycle. And the second thing we did was have stricter regulations, but also better incentives. One of the things we did is having the LED certification a mandatory process in building uh, new buildings. <coughs> so now we have stricter standards and tax benefits. And also we decided to renew standards every three years to make sure that we encourage innovation in green buildings. Because the, the um, standards we had before were not really flexible and thought that it limited possible innovations that could benefit us in um, reducing greenhouse gases. And also to help um, smaller corporations and individuals, we decided to provide more funding if they um, were planning to make buildings for a lazy certification in Silver Ohio. All right, so one thing that we have here in 2030 that y'all didn't have in 2020 is an increased usage of mixed-use areas. So what a mixed-use area is, is essentially a building or a space of buildings where uh, commercial areas, residential areas, and office spaces are all located within the same building. And so this allows, first of all, for much more independence of movement. So um, this also implies that it's a lot safer to move around especially for those who are elderly and it's like it's difficult for them to move around. And this kind of relates to um, sustainable <coughs> nostalgia in that we want a place that we can call home into the future. And um, alongside this, there's a lot less use of transportation. I'll get a little bit um, more into that in the next time. And so more on the um, reduced use of transportation is that uh, essentially we'll see more of these rentable bicycles that we saw in 2020, alongside uh, self-driving shuttles. And this also impacts building design. So a study done in 2020 by MIT News on um, Ann Arbor's Im uh, implementation of self-driving shuttles all around like the UMich campus um, over, the, um, over the course of 2016 and 2020 has shown the positive impact that self-driving shuttles actually have on people. And um, this includes, so the self-driving shuttles themselves, um, um, they still work with other cars. So they still had to like work with intersections and they still had to um, interact with pedestrians a lot more than self-driving shuttles have to in 2030. And they also 
also have uh, housed uh, about 11 people per, um, per shuttle. But uh, overall, this reduced short um, taxi trips costs by 44 to 61% on average. So um, there are a lot more cost reductions even for like much shorter trips and much longer trips. And um, the way that this impacts building design is that there is a lot more traffic if we just have the current building design with the self-driving shuttles pulling up to the curbside. So the ground floor buildings become much more porous in that there's a lot more entry and exit points so that self-driving shuttles can come and go um, constantly. And so this leads into <coughs> buildings becoming more um, self-sufficient as well. And so one really big thing that we have here in 2030 is that buildings are net zero, meaning all the energy that they need is produced by the building inside. And so currently, um, or in 2020, one of the big technologies used to do this um, are solar panels. And so with solar panels, um, one of the big problems is solar panel degradation. But in March 2020, there was a breakthrough in solar panels in that now we can more efficiently use perovskites without um, the same degradation that we see. And so the degradation that we currently see is called halide segregation, in which um, these molecules, uh, classified as halides, often form groupings. So as you can see on the very right, um, uh, the mixed halides that are in normal solar panels um, over the course of like a lot of illumination will start forming groupings with each other. And this is characteristic of degradation of solar panels. However, we were able to suppress this degradation with new technologies in solar panels. And we also have this, um, this uh, concept of solar panels in 2020 that we now see in 2030, where we're able to attach them to balloons and float them up above the clouds, which allows for much more, um, much more power generation. And so what I was talking about earlier kind of with um, mixed use areas, one problem is uh, mapping data. So essentially, since everyone's living a lot closer together, it's much more difficult to collect data and thus to um, allocate energy from the smart grid or from like the electric grid. So that's where the smart grid comes in, is where we're collecting a lot more data so we have more efficient designs for um, allocating electricity. So um, basically it's like we're trying to get more energy to um, to buildings and um, to buildings and like office spaces in the daytime, whereas we're trying to allocate more of the energy to like residential spaces in the evenings when that's where it's needed the most. And so currently, our algorithms for doing this are um, heuristic algorithms, meaning that um, we don't have like an actual like perfect um, approximation of when each person needs their energy. Like it's pretty difficult to know when each specific person needs to use like amount of energy. So heuristic algorithms try to approximate when someone would need a certain amount of energy. And so an example of a heuristic algorithm is like a neural network in like machine learning models that we see today. So how these work is that, um, <coughs> in essence, is that we have a certain amount of error. So imagine like you just like throw energy out at everyone and see um, how much energy everyone uses. And this is um, um, obviously like if we do this, we're going to see that um, everyone is using a lot, like a different amount of energy than we're just like throwing at them. And so this, this generates um, our first error amount. And so what we do is we try to like reduce this error over time, <coughs> and then we get to our like global minimum, but obviously that's not like zero error, right? And so instead of using a heuristic algorithm, in 2030 we have developed algorithms that allow us to reach much lower than this global, or this kind of local minimum, and where we're able to reach like a global cost minimum. So the last, uh, because we're planning to make cities denser, we have to keep in mind the urban, <coughs> urban heat effect, which causes the urban areas to be warmer than surrounding rural um, areas forming an <coughs> island of um, higher temperature. This is because, first of all, the paved surfaces uh, in cities absorb solar radiation as heat. Um, and as cities have denser human populations, the human activities generate heat. And also because it's so hot, people use more <coughs> conditioning, which results in more use of fossil fuels and increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, <coughs> please welcome
was expected to triple in New York City by 2020 <coughs> and triple again by 2080. But we prevented this by planting, by planting trees, <coughs> which helped reduce urban island effect and to reduce fossil fuel when using air conditioning. Uh, plants cool cities by absorbing sun, shading buildings, and through evaporation. And as most of you know, the other benefits of planting trees are uh, reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And it is the best tool we have that has the lowest cost and lasts a long period of time. And also it has, the study have shown that there are many um, social, psychological, and health benefits of human exposure to um, green spaces, which includes stress, stress and anxiety <coughs> reduction, improved cognitive functioning, lower risk of um, depression and overall greater mental and physical well-being. Um, yeah, so several ways to um, have more plants in cities are like planting 